So, okay, public service announcement before I begin. I gave this uh, talk about Git many times in the last couple of years. In fact, the organizers of the conference kind of complained about that. They were like, you cannot talk about the same stuff over and over. But like uh, um, an aging pop star who only had one successful song, I'm going to do this again f once. Okay, this is the last time I talk about Git internals as a conference. Thank you. And I'm going to do it without slides this time. Okay, thank you. This was the highest point of the presentation. It's all down here for you. So, about Git. Um, most people starting to learn Git have uh, uh, some kind of struggle trying to learn all those commands and all those options to those commands. I've been there, I'm still there somehow. And um, I think that the reason for that is that most Git trainings are doing it wrong. Actually, if you look at Git, Git is actually surprisingly simple internally. It's based on a surprisingly consistent, a small set of core ideas, a model, if you wish. And my argument is that if you understand the model, then it will be much easier to understand how Git works and understand all the commands on top of the model. So this is what I'm striving to do today, to give you the basics of Git, to give you the model, and uh, hopefully you will find something interesting in it, whether you are just a beginner Git user or maybe even an experienced Git user. Um, if you never used Git before, you might struggle at times. You may worried. But otherwise, you m will probably find something of value here. So uh, let's make this a little bit more interactive than a normal presentation. So feel free to interrupt me during the presentation to ask questions, because there are no slides. So the entertainment value dwindles here. So feel free, OK? And hopefully you can all see what's written there, right? OK, cool. At its very core, if you peel off all the layers of Git, it becomes simple. By peeling off all the layers, I mean that, well, if you look on Wikipedia for a Git definition, you will probably find something like, Git as is a distributed revision control system, something like that. And this is a lot of stuff to wrap your mind around. First of all, forget about the distribution part. Forget about it altogether. Imagine that there are no distributed systems in the world. There is only one computer in the world. It's this computer here. I'm going to run Git on this computer. And also forget about the versioning part. For, uh, for a moment, to just peel off all that complexity. If you look at the core of Git, at the very bottom of Git, I would argue that Git is a map. It's just a simple map. You give Git a piece of content, it comes up with a hash for that piece of content. Actually, there is a Git command that does exactly that. It's a seldom used command. It's called hash object. And this is a command that takes an object and retires a hash. I wish I could do this, just pass it a piece of content, for example, the string apple pie. Uh, doesn't work like that because this is what Git calls a plumbing command, a very low level command that you're not even intended to use in regular, on your daily job. It's there for a more advanced scripting and the like, so it's really unfriendly. The way that you can pass a piece of content to this command is by piping it. So I will pipe this string into hash object, and then I will tell hash object to read the string from um, standard input. It's a very complicated convolution, but never mind. What I'm doing is to say, hey, here is a string, git. give me the hash, and here is the hash. It's this hash, and it's exactly this hash. If I do it over and over again, 
23, it's always the same hash, okay? If I change anything in this string, then I get a completely different hash. This is important because everything that you do in Git, every file that you put in Git, every directory, every commit in Git, is gonna get its own hash. So every now and then somebody is like, okay, what if I have a very large project? And uh, uh, in this project, I have two pieces of information, a commit and, I don't know, a file, and they end up having the same hash. Wouldn't Git break then? Wouldn't that break my project? And the answer is, yeah, of course it would, but it's very unlikely to happen. And it's uh, instructive because it's fun somehow to see how unlikely that is. If you look at this hash, it's uh, 40 bytes. What's the chances of two 40 bytes hashes colliding? Uh, our brains are not very good at understanding large numbers, so let's come up with a practical example. Imagine winning the Powerball lottery in the US, the one where you win a lot of billions, uh, that, the big one. Uh, the chances of winning the lottery are 1 in 175 millions. That means that if you print out one ticket for every possible combination of numbers in the lottery, and then if you distribute those tickets around the world, one every 25 centimeters, say, you spend the whole equator. Now imagine walking the length of the whole equator and only once picking up a ticket, and it, yeah, it turns out to be the winning ticket. Congratulations. And uh, that's how unlikely it is to win the Powerball lottery. Now imagine doing this six times in a row and winning every time. Those are the chances of two hashes colliding in Git. So my point is, it's not going to happen. Git hashes are unique. They're not just unique in your own project. They are unique in the universe. This is an important piece of information once you start looking at distribution. So, for now, don't think about distribution. Just think about generating Git on this computer, okay? Uh, generating hashes. So we have a hash. So Git is a map. It's not just a map. It's uh, a persistent map, because once it comes up with the hash, it's also going to take your piece of content and store it on the disk. Like, if I add a minus W switch here, which stands for write, then Git is going to write this piece of content on my disk. Not quite, not now, because there is no Git repository here, so Git doesn't have a place to put this piece of content, right? I need to create such a place. Can you tell me the command to do that? Bear with me, it's gonna get a little bit more complicated. But for now, I just said git in it. What happened here is that Git in it created a dot git folder. And what's inside that folder? Well, first let me save this piece of content, okay? Now it did get saved. Where? Let's open the dot git folder and inside this dot git folder there is an objects subfolder which is called the object database. And inside this subfolder, there is a folder. Okay, there are these two things. Ignore them for now. And uh, they, these are just low level optimization stuff. And uh, there is this subfolder called O2. And if you look at this, it's just the first two digits of the hash. And, there are, and the file that is inside this folder is the rest of the hash. So this file is our piece of content. It contains the string apple pie. I cannot just put it on the screen because it's been zipped. And I never actually learned how to unzip stuff from the command line with gzip, so I can't do that. But uh, what I can do 
is to uh, use another git command that is going to unzip it for me and give me other information. And it's called, I think, git cat file. And I can give you the first few digits of the hash. They are usually enough. Git will warn me if there is any conflict there, like multiple hashes starting with these digits. And then I can say, give me, for example, the type of this piece of information, OK? And it's telling me it's a blob. Blob is git speak for a piece of information, just a sequence of bytes. And what's the content of this stuff? Minus P for pretty printing. Apple pie, OK? So this is what it does. It's a map. You give it something, it saves it on your disk. As simple as that. Now, how can we take a map and build something more interesting on it that can actually manage my files and directories? Um, let's see. Let's first look for uh, a project here. I have a ready-made project, a cookbook. So I'm going to move into the, oh, wait a minute. I don't want it here. I want it here. So let me move into the cookbook. And uh, here is the structure of the cookbook. Okay. There is a menu file in the folder. And if you look at this file, it contains the storing apple pie. And then there is a recipe subdirectory. And inside the recipe subdirectory, you can find a readme, which just gives me some, I don't know, information about the whole project, and an apple pie file that also contains the storing apple pie. OK? Super simple project. So let's create a Git repository out of this. I will git in it, and then, well, you probably know the rep at this point. I have these files. They are untracked. I have to add them to Git, and then I can commit them. Uh, for people who are not used to Git, we have this concept in Git of an intermediary staging area. So at first, I put the stuff on the staging area, and then I commit the stuff. It's a two-step process, as opposed to other versioning systems who do this in one step. But you probably know this. So let me add the entire thing. And let me commit the entire thing. So boom. I just created the stuff in the object repository, of course. What kind of stuff? Well, there are plenty of folders in here now. So I created a lot of objects. And what I'm going to do now is I want to look at these objects and see exactly what they are. So this part is a bit slow, but it's pretty important that you wrap your head around this. So bear with me, OK? It's going to take 10 minutes. I can start with the log. And in the log, I can see that there is a commit here. And the commit has this hash. And if you look at it, of course, this object representing the commit is in there, right? It's in the object database. You can see the folder where it's being stored. It starts with 1.9. So the first question is, if there is an object here representing the commit, it's here, what does this object look like? What's inside this thing? I use a command called cat file before, right? And the last time we knew what was in there, it was the string apple pie. But this time we don't necessarily know what's in there. 5B811. So I would like to have a look at it. Boom. And there it is. So this is what a commit looks like. I want to stress this, it's important. This is not really what a commit looks like, this is the commit. It's exactly, physically, literally the commit. A commit is just a piece of text. And like any other piece of text in Git, it has its own hash. So it was just zipped 
and hashed and persisted. And what's inside this hash? Well, metadata, information about the commit, right? The author, that's me, the committer, that's also me, thank you, and uh, uh, the message, dates, and this thing here, a tree. What's a tree? You are too damn quiet. Uh, okay, good. That's that's a good definition. Uh, I mean, con in this specific context, say again. Sorry. No, it's it's some kind of structure, and in, actually, it's not really a pointer. The tree is not really a pointer. This is somehow a pointer, right? It's a hash, so it's referring to the tree. But if you look inside the database, the tree is B, E, 4, D, and there it is. It's an object in the database. So this thing that you have here is a reference to the tree, right? What the tree is, is git speak for a directory. So essentially, I have a commit, and the commit is pointing to a directory, and the directory is the root directory of my project, of my cookbook. So I don't have slides, so let me draw a picture of this somehow. I hope this contraption that I came with actually works. Give me one second. Boom. Yeah, you got to cheat, right, in those slides. So, okay, we have a commit here. Okay? And the hash of this commit is, sorry again, 195. Five. Boom. And the commit is pointing to a tree. Let's make the tree yellow. It is not as fast as I wish, but yeah. Uh, I, I can do that uh, at the end of this presentation for a fee. B E four D. B E four. Okay. So, we have a commit pointing to a tree. And what does a tree look like? Well, we can ask the usual command here, right? The tree is BE4D5. Let's look at a tree. Boom, it's another piece of text just a piece of text. And it contains information about the content of the tree and what's inside the tree. First, another tree called 3EE76. -E I'm gonna make a picture of this, by the way, because you're not watching. Mm. Okay, and a blob called 2399. So let me draw the blob as well. I've been busy. Let's make the blob uh, blue. Okay. So the blob is sorry, uh, 2399. There is a reason for this, believe me. 2399 and the three is Okay, what's this blob? Which one? 
look at the content of my project again. In my root folder, I have a menu file and the recipes directory. So this must be the recipes directory, right? This must be the menu file. How do I know it's the menu file? Do you have memory for 40 bytes numbers? This is the hash of the blob, and it's also the hash of the string apple pie. It's exactly the same hash that we had earlier on when I hashed the string apple pie. No, it's not, but that's probably because I have uh, uh, a, uh, yeah. Oh, oh, this is the spaced one. Okay, 2399, it's exactly the same one. Okay, cool. So this is what it did. It picked the content of the file, it hashed that, then it created a tree that pointed to this file and another tree. And let me do this once more. I know it's a bit boring, but it's almost over. If I look at this other tree, I find two blobs. One that is story six one, and hey, this, is, this must be the readme, right? And this one, by now you will probably recognize it. You remember that this file has the same content as this file, right? Okay, it's draw a picture time. So, this story here, is pointing to a blob called the 361. Three, six, one, and let me draw it. And another blob that we already have because it's called the 23, and hey, it's this blob here. Makes sense so far. Now we're going to do it all over again with the second commit, and then we're done. So master some energy, folks. Huh? Cognitive psychology tells us that when you are really focused on something, when you're thinking real hard, your pupils dilate. It's actually one of only three or four phenomena, apart from actually variation in light level, that can make your pupil dilate. It's uh, focusing on your heart, orgasm, and uh, a lot uh, being suddenly scared. Now, I'm working under the hypothesis that nobody in this room is having an orgasm. <laughs> I hope you are having a lot of fun. You are probably not scared. I hope so. So I can see your pupils dilate, and that's a very good sign. Let's add another commit, but first let's change something, right? For example, let me edit the menu file and add cheesecake to the menu file. And now I can add this file, and I can commit, whoops, sorry, add cheesecake. And now I have two commits. The second commit is called D3. I'm gonna make a picture of it. D3. And if I look inside this commit, I find that there is a tree here called 6EE, fair enough, and there is also something that wasn't there with the previous commit. Can you see what it is? The first commit was the first one. It didn't have a parent, of course. This one does have a parent. It's pointing at the previous commit. And then there is another tree. And if I look at these other three, this is the last time I do this. I find yet another blob and yet another tree. And if I keep doing this, I will find that ultimately, in this structure, there we go. 
up this line. <laughs> so in this structure, this tree is pointing in the end at the same tree that the first tree was pointing at. Hmm? And a new blob, which is called F1. I'm done with this, with this picture. Now we can look at it. Okay, what do we have here? First, Git likes to reuse stuff. It's not gonna create new things. In this case, in the new commit, I have a new file there, right? I changed the menu file, and that blob up there is the new menu file, which means that the tree that is pointing at that file must be new because it contains a new data, so it gets a new hash, and that's that tree. But on the other end, all this stuff is the same as it was before. So Git is just reusing it. This is the ending of the boring part. Are you still with me? Look at this, look at this structure. Thank you, folks. Look at what we have here. It's a very smart way to organize things. Because if I use the commits as an entry point, and I just move through these arrows, if I get in from this commit, then what I see is uh, actually, I, oh yes, is a root hmm? and then a file in the root and then another tree and another file. And uh, it's uh, reusing the files because the names of the files are not stored inside the files. They are stored in the trees that contain the files, right? And then when I have a second commit, same thing. I can enter the entire structure from there. And if I ignore everything else, I can just navigate the structure, the structure and I have a snapshot on my repository at that point in time. Is the mechanics of storing a repository, of storing a snapshot clear? Think about this for a moment. We have a system here where we have things that contain stuff, content, bytes, blobs. And then we have things that contain other things, trees, hmm? that can contain trees and other blobs. And the names of these things, they are not in the things, they are in the things that contain the things. Does this structure here remind you of anything in particular? Yes, sir. It's a file system. This is actually literally a file system. It's a high-level file system. It's built on top of your existing disk file system. But it's still a file system because it's essentially a way to track and organize your content in a hierarchical way with containers and the links, you know, like exactly like the symbolic links in your file system. And there is nothing strange with that. After all, it was written by Linus Torvalds, who's a file system kind of guy, right? He's a, a kernel person. So this is actually what Git really is. It is a file system built on top of your file system. And it has an additional feature besides and um, over your file system, which it has these things that are not in your file system. Commits. So it's a version file system. And that's what it is, really. And actually, if you look at the Git man page, It's a stupid content tracker, okay? Everything 
that you have to know about the Git object model you just learned. There, are, there is another kind of object in the Git object database, that's tags. I didn't talk about tags, but I could in five minutes, I won't because let's spare some time for other more important things. But actually, now you know the entire Git object model. That's why the stupid. That's all it does. Of course, that's not all it does. We wouldn't be using it. And we have half an hour to fill. So it does other things. There are things that virtual systems do. So branching, emerging, for example, right? So let's add one more layer to this system. You know about branches, and you know that we already have a branch. It's called the master, and Git created this branch the moment that we created the project with Git in it. So, what's a branch? Let me create a second branch, okay? That was fast. What's a branch? Physically, I mean. No, it doesn't need to be a tree. Yes, sir. Let's see. I think this is very, very close. Let's look inside the .git folder. And inside that folder, we will see that there is a subfolder called the refs for references. And inside this subfolder, there are two other subfolders. One is tags, forget about this for now, I won't be talking about this. And another one that is called heads. And inside that thing, there are two files called the master and second. And what do you, ex you expect to see inside master? A hash. D3C. Do you recognize this hash? Yes, it's just a pointer to a commit. That's what a branch is. I would draw it. So, and it's called master. Okay? That's all it is. By that's all it is, I mean literally. I, uh, I want to be very clear on this because you might think that I'm you know, using metaphors to make things sound easier. So let's do something. Let's create another branch called whatever by copying and pasting the files. Boom, there it is. I just created a branch. Not the right way. Don't do that. And let me delete this. So master is actually pointing at the uh, latest commit, right? And uh, while we are here talking about this picture, I think that for now, we can't forget about the entire tree and blob structure and focus on the commits. Actually, the commits are what we will be talking about for the rest of this presentation here. Okay? Hey. What we have here. Okay. So, what do you expect to see inside the other branch, second? Your pupils are delaying. Exactly the same thing, right? We created it in the same spot, so yeah, that's what it is. Once again, let me do this again, like this, and second. OK? 
came. Hmm? But these two branches are not really the same. There is a difference, a difference between the two branches, right? Second is all pale and sad, while mustard is very green and uh, looks cool and it has an asterisk by it. Why? That's the current branch. What does that mean, by the way? Yeah, it's where you are committing. So apparently Git knows where we are committing. How does it know? I like your way of thinking. There must be some file where that information is stored, right? And it must be here in the .git folder somewhere. Any clues as to what the name of that file could be? I'm betting on head. This syntax here is git syntax to say this syntax here is just actually bash syntax, but this syntax here is git syntax to say we are referencing a reference. In this case, I cannot use a hash. Why? Because what head is pointing at is not a commit. It's not an object in the database. Only objects in the database have hashes. But in this case, what head is pointing at is a branch, hence it's another file, so we need to do with this weird syntax here. Here is what's happening in there. Head is a pointer to a pointer. Does that make sense? So, they don't look like branches, do they? They look like pointers, yeah, because that's what they are. So, what happens if we commit, for example? What happens if I, I don't know, create a new file here and add this file and then I, ugh. I hate those. And, and then I commit, add one more file, not a smart commit name, and now I have a new commit. What happened here inside the repository? Well, first, I created a new commit, right? It has a hash, whatever, whatever. Yeah, we can, uh, we can write the hash down here. 80, oh my god, forget it. 82, okay. And this commit is pointing at the previous commit, of course. And of course, Git had to update all the pointers. Which pointers of the three that I drew you there, is Git going to update? How many of them first? One, two, or three? <laughs> You're pretty evenly split between one and two. Okay, I think that we can all agree that second is not impacted, all right? Nobody's gonna touch second. It's not even the current branch. So we can all agree that master is going to change. I think that the disagreement here stems from head. Is head going to change or not? Uh, fair enough. So let's change this picture, right? What is going to happen here is that, sorry, let me be more precise. Master is moving. And head is just coming along for the ride. Head is not changing. Head was pointing at uh, master before, and it's still pointing at master. 
So head didn't change, but the current branch, the branch pointed at by head, did change to track our changes to the object database. While the other branches are staying there where they used to be. Okay? So this makes sense. So what if I want to move head now? Is there an operation in Git that moves head? There are plenty. The most obvious operation in Git that moves head is called checkout. So we have two branches. Second is not the current branch. Let's make second the current branch. Boom. We switch to branch second. What happened here? So this is what happened. I should revert the arrow, but uh, yeah, never mind. OK? Sorry. Let's make it a bit more visible. OK? Does that make sense? And in fact, if you look at head now, it's pointing at second. Second didn't move. Master didn't move. Only head moved. And something else happened. Do you know what? Yeah. Where is my new file? It's not there. Because after moving to another place in history, to another commit, Git started looking into that commit and it started walking the structure in the database starting from that commit, just like we did before. And it's looking at the trees and creating directories out of them. And it's looking at blobs and creating files out of them. And whatever is not there, it's getting rid of it. Essentially, we walked back in time with a very simple change of pointer followed by an update of our working area, which contains a lesson for us. That is, Git doesn't give a damn about your working area. It's actually the most transient, the most useless part of the entire project. When something is in the database, it's pretty safe. You know, objects, immutable, with hashes, but your working area, as soon as you check out, boom, there it goes. Git thinks that your working area is shit. Okay, it's not going to destroy your data when you haven't committed the data yet. So there is some safeguard in place here, right? But you'd better work under this assumption. Nothing really exists unless it's in the .git folder. Everything in your working area is subject to die at the next git command. Okay? Okay, let's add a commit. This time I will, um, I will add another file and commit it. So, good. What happened now? You know the ref, right? We have another commit here. Actually, we can take this commit here and move it aside a little bit to make some space and Let me, yeah, you know, reshape the picture a little bit to make it more visible. And of course, hey, never mind. Mm -hmm. The second commit now is moving here, and head is following along. Now they do look like branches, eh? Does that make sense? Now, let me move to master again. Oops. 
So we just moved the head from that corner where it kind of disappeared to this place. My, this is ugly. Okay. Now, what if I want to have a history here in master that includes the current history master, that is commit 82, commit D3, and also that other commit on that other side, that is, by the way, called uh, da, 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 195. So I want all of these commits in my history. I want 82 and I want 195. How do I do that in Git? There are actually multiple ways to do it. Merge, rebase, cherry pick, which is a rebase. Uh, let's, let's do a merge. Let's do it easy, huh? a merge. It's a merge, nobody's gonna get hurt. So, I remind you, we are on master, right? That's where head is pointing, and we are saying merge with second. So, boom, Git is actually creating a commit message for us, which makes sense, we can change it, but I don't want to change it, I'm happy with this. So I'm saying, yeah, I accept this message, and now I have a new merge commit in the git log. It's a merge commit because if you look at it, this is the last time that I'm going to use cat file, I guess, it actually has not one but two parents. Hmm? So it's like one, two, and here it is. And it's called C3. Okay? C3. And of course, what happened is that master is moving to this new commit and is carrying head with it. Uh, I should have switched. So, <laughs> there is a new commit there. It has two parents. It's called the C3 and the master is moving to the new commit and carrying head with it. Okay? Okay. Now, let's do the same thing from the other side. I want to have the same history in second, the other branch. So, I can get check out second here, okay? Which means that head is, wait, head is moving to second. There is not enough space on that side, okay? And now I will say, I'm on second now, okay? And I will say git merge master. What's going to happen now? Okay, one thing that could happen here is that Git does exactly the same thing it just did. It creates a new commit that has two parts, okay? One and two and then proceeds to move second and head to this commit here, okay? But if you think about it, that would be a waste. Think about what we are trying to achieve here. What we are trying to do is to have a history in second that includes all the current history from second and all the current history from master. We want a commit that if we walk back from this commit, we find all the previous commits from second and master, right? That's what we want. 
That's why we do the merge in the first place. But we already have such a commit, right? Which one is it? C3, we already have it. We don't need to create a new commit for these. What we can do is simply this. Hmm? That's all we need to do. And now we have all of our history. You remember, Git doesn't like to waste stuff. It doesn't like to create objects that are not necessary, right? So what it can do is to just take these pointers and change the pointer. And this is an operation known as a fast forward. It's here. So when you see fast forwarding Git, that's what happened. It's Git telling you, hey, I could spare an object in the database by just moving pointers around. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. We have 10 more minutes. Yes, sir. No, I don't. I mean, unless Git knows, because of the structure of this graph, that it's the same version as in the past, Git is not m too concerned with doing file diffs or state diffs. It's not going to say, hey, look, I'm being super smart here. Essentially, you created a bunch of commits, and then you created a bunch of commits which exactly revert the previous commits, so I can probably move the pointer somewhere you don't expect. That would be super confusing. So Git is not going to play this trick on you. Okay? So, let's look back at what we have. What we built layer by layer. The first layer was a persistent map. The second layer was a way to use this map to organize your data into a stupid content tracker, essentially a version file system. The third layer that we explored was a way to take this version file system and add features over it, like branches and merges. And I'm sorry, I couldn't do rebases, which are really interesting and also confusing until you know how they work and then they're super simple. And that's all the stuff that makes Git into a versioning system. And then there is distribution. And I don't have the time to talk about distribution here. But if you just think back to the map, you remember what we said. Each object you put in Git has a hash, and the hash is unique in the universe. Well, at this point, distribution becomes pretty simple. Because all we need to do is to just look at the hashes Right? If you connect to GitHub and you start pushing and pulling, all that Git has to do is to look at the hashes and say, hey, I see a few objects here that are not in the repository there. They are unique in the universe, so I can trust the hashes. Here, let me move them up to the repository. So essentially, that's the basic idea behind Git distribution. Sorry. I have an online training about this. In case you subscribe to Pluralsight, uh, which is a um, screencasting subscription model site, there is a How Git Works training there, which is a couple hours. And it goes into quite a lot more detail about the internals of Git. So, if you happen to have a subscription there, by all means, go and check it. For now, we only have a few minutes, so I would say, what are your questions? Yes. Eccomi.
thank you very much for the great session. You're very welcome. Eh? Uh, my question is, what does it happen if I do um, a rebase or a merge that involves multiple commits? Does it, does Git create a single node that involves all the all the commits or uh, single merges with with single commits in the middle? Um, so your question is, uh, I create a merge and uh, I didn't diverge by just oh sorry yeah, I I by, by just one commit, commits, but yeah. many of them. Uh, in this case, merges and rebases are very different. They behave very differently. Uh, I didn't touch on rebases, so I. I will skip on that. Um, about merges, no, the important thing is that you have the same history, right? So if you look at, a, I don't know, a complicated project, I don't know, let's look at, um, yeah, any old project that I have here. And there are probably bound to be a few merges in here. Oh my, this is the cleanest project ever. But this is, uh, this is one example, right? This is a merge after a lot of divergence. And uh, these, you know, the, there were two extra, extra commits here and a bunch of extra commits here. And all it needs to do, Git, is create one single commit that has, as a parent, the latest commits in both branches. And the other commits are still reachable. And of course, there is some uh, reshaping of the connections between these commits and the trees and the blobs. But it's actually way easier than it looks. Uh, I, I could draw these easily. Well, maybe not with this thing, but with a proper you know, paper. And uh, in the end, it's, uh, it's very simple. All it needs to do is create one commit with two parents or more parents. You don't, you're not limited to two parents. There is a famous commit in the Linux kernel that has, I think, 12 parents. Don't try these at <laughs> home, okay? I guess the, um, the rebase is much more complex. Rebases are actually not more complex. Uh, I don't have the time again, so I'm sorry, but rebases are just a different mechanic to do the, uh, a similar thing. They involve very different trade-offs. Again, I don't want to elaborate on that because it would be confusing. OK, that's cool. Thank you very much. You're welcome. But you can ask me after this session. Next question. Last question. <laughs> that was uh, harsh. Yeah, but uh, it's two minutes from the end. Nobody else? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.